minus 20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Hey, what's up everyone? Thanks for joining us on the show today. My name is Manny Bernabe. I am your host and today we have a very special guest, Alex Castronis, who is the founder of The Why of AI, an organization that helps companies get up to speed with AI and machine learning. He is the author of AI for People and Business, a great book, a great book that covers AI for business applications. Um, and he's also a former IndyCar data scientist, so plenty to talk about, um, and I'm really excited to have him on the show. We are live. The benefit of that is that you get to ask questions and you get to participate in the conversation, so don't be shy. Put your comments in the, the comments area, whether that's on YouTube, Twitter, or LinkedIn, and we'll try to interweave that into the show. So with that said, Al, uh, Alex, come on, come on to the stage and, and let's, let's, let's get chatting. Hey, Alex, how are you? Awesome, Manny. How are you? Doing well. Let's say hi to everyone tuning in on LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Hey everyone, um, and, and and before we get started, uh, so again, hey everyone, I gotta say that like that rock music thing, like I'm amped up, I'm ready to go. That was awesome. The, uh, that the intro that there. that's it, man. We try to provide not only education but entertainment here on the Manny Bernabe show, <laughs> trying to make AI and machine learning as interesting as possible, right? <laughs> yep, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Alex, hey, um, why don't we? Talk about you at South by Southwest. I'm sorry, I think I'm changing up the agenda a little bit, but we chatted a little bit about that before we went live. Can you talk about what you were doing down there, your experience, and 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 uh, what what you kind of liked about it? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Thanks for asking. So, uh, spoke down at South by Southwest last week. It was my first uh, South by Southwest experience in general, actually. So. Just being there was really awesome. Uh, got to see a lot of great talks, uh, panels, different things. Unfortunately, not so much uh, in the way of music and film and some of the other stuff going on. There's just so much going on at South by Southwest. So it's it's quite uh, overwhelming in a way. And there was a lot of uh, talks and things that I wanted to check out. But um, yeah, it was great. I joined a, a panel. It was me and two other people, um, Casey and Pamela. Um, and Casey Uditz is a, a filmmaker. Um, and he sort of started, uh, I met him through uh, some speaking uh, speaking engagement that we both participated in. I was on a panel, he was a moderator, and then he uh, started creating this documentary around this children's book, actually. And, you know, uh, it's called I Want My Hat Back. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it, Manny, but um, it's kind of a well-known children's book. And um, I won't sort of give away the story, but basically it led to him wondering whether or not AI can sort of answer a very key question about the book. And like, how does the level of human intelligence of AI compared or intelligence in general with AI compared to human intelligence. And in particular with respect to a children's book and also children level intelligence at a very young age. And so it sparked this sort of mini documentary that he created. And then we sort of decided to create a live, um, sort of storytelling, narrative, performative panel type thing. And we tried to re re envision the standard panel of just like, you know, here's a mic, ask a question, just pass the mic back and forth, but try and make it more engaging. Uh, and so that's what we were doing down there. We, we did a, uh, a session in South by Southwest based on uh, that concept and sort of his mini documentary. Cool. And I'm curious about the makeup of the audience. Was it mostly technical folks or were there, is it, was it, were, were they artists? I mean, who was this appealing to? Across the board. That's a great question. It was really, it, so it was well attended. We got a great turnout and uh, we had quite a few people come to speak to us afterwards and ask questions and things. I mean, there were people with PhDs in AI actually. Um, oh, and yeah, like uh, legitimate AI researchers and research scientists. 
but there were also people that just wanted to learn more about AI and thought it was a sort of an interesting topic to try and uh, frame sort of the capabilities of AI as compared to not only humans, but again, uh, sort of younger children level uh, intelligence. So yeah, just, I think it appealed in various ways to a variety of people. Any other good talks that, that you remember or that stand out for you? Um, yeah, I saw some great talks actually. Um, one, of, one of them was also AI related. It was really kind of talking of actually a timely talk really in terms of, you know, one of the things we hear a lot about these days is this idea of AI fairness and bias and, you know, ethical considerations and things like that. So I saw a, a really great talk about that and um, sort of how people are approaching some of those, some of those uh, topics, right? And what, what we maybe should be thinking about or potentially expect in the future around that. Um, but yeah, I saw a bunch of AI thing, you know, talks and I saw a lot of talks not related to AI that were also really great. So it was just, I highly recommend it to anybody that hasn't been down there. It's a lot of fun. Cool. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to it. It's definitely on my, uh, my bucket list uh, to head down there. I hear a lot of great things about it. Um, awesome. cool. Hey, Alex, I think, uh, I appreciate that. I, I would love to jump into, um, um, some of the questions that, that, that I get quite a bit and love your take on it. Uh, and for me, the questions that I'm oftentimes getting is, Manny, how should I be getting started with AI as a company? If I'm a mid-sized company, I don't have a data science team necessarily. A, do I even need AI in machine learning? Should I be thinking about that? And if so, what's the general approach to getting started without blowing out into a big R&D disaster? So I'd, <laughs> I'd, love, I'd love to start there and, and, and kind of hear your thoughts on that. In particular, in terms of like, hey, do you know, do you is AI always the answer, or is there are there times when you should be looking elsewhere and then coming back to AI? Lots of questions there, all good ones, and happy to dive in for sure. I get asked the same questions all the time, so these are very important questions to answer. Um, so let's start with the this idea of you know, do you need AI? Do you not need AI? That kind of thing, right? Um, one of the things that first of all ai it's it's so funny because ai is this like term we use as if it's like this thing right it's a small compact thing we just label ai and then done deal that's it right um but ai is actually and, and you know this it's a massive massive field that you know you got you got personalization recommenders predictive analytics classification natural language techniques computer vision um, reinforcement learning, the list just goes on and on and on. And so when you kind of look at all the things you can accomplish with AI on at like the use case or task level, um, you know, it's, it's massive, right? There's a lot you can do with AI. And so then the, the question becomes sort of, I always, uh, you know, I wrote an article, it's on the O'Reilly, uh, radar website, um, called how to set AI goals. And in it, I talk about I'm a big fan of first starting with goals, right? High level goals. What are you trying to accomplish exactly? And, you know, you take a look sort of at what are your goals? What are the potential use cases? And um, can AI even help solve those problems? And if so, how can it help achieve these goals or solve these problems or whatever the case may be? Um, and then you sort of ask, like, are you doing it today? Are you not? Can humans do it today? Uh, if not, why not? Right. Because if humans aren't able to do certain things, then it may be the case that AI also isn't able to do certain things. Right. Um, but if it's a, if it's something that, you know, maybe AI could help with, um, you know, you kind of have to think, well, is it is it going to be a significant enough gain to make like if you think from a cost benefit analysis perspective, is it going to be a significant enough potential gain um, as compared to what you're doing today or if humans are doing it today uh that it's it's potentially worth the investment right um and also one of the things that ai and again it's a big field that can do lots of things uh can do is it can do certain things that humans can't on their own in general right so it's another one of these things like is this a use case that like you know you can't accomplish that, that maybe there's too much data and you know, your typical data scientist or data analyst or business intelligence, you know, developer or analyst, you know, they just can't understand all the correlations, patterns, relationships, and everything across all the data you have 
uh, it really takes something a little bit more sophisticated to kind of detect these patterns and understand them and then use them to, you know, either make predictions or, act, you know, help drive decisions or uh, provide some sort of actionable insights and those kinds of things. Um, so in general, I really, you know, I, I really ahead. like that. Sorry, I was just saying. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right here. yeah, of course. I, I like that framing. Yeah. I'm thinking about what can AI, what can humans do and how AI might uh, speed that up? Because there are, I feel like there are a lot of tasks that where humans are reading text, for example, and coming up with some classification. And so that just is taking a lot of time by uh, workers. We can use NLP to do that or image recognition. Like, do you just have to bucket things and add a label to it? That might be a good opportunity for AI. And then your second bucket is things that AI or humans just can't do. And so if I want to do like say predictive lead scoring and have a multi-factor uh, type of model or explanation as to why a lead is good over another lead, and I want to crunch that over a giant database, a human is not going to be able to do that. Maybe that's a good opportunity for AI to come in and, and help the process along in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And you touch on a really interesting point, which is the idea of helping, right? Um, so that's a whole area of AI as well, this idea of like human augmented intelligence, where it's sort of less about AI kind of automating what you do every day, uh, and more about how can AI sort of it, it enable uh, people to do their jobs better in a more enjoyable way, uh, more be more creative, more productive actually do the things that humans are best at doing, uh, which is like critical thinking, problem solving, decision making, uh, so on and so forth, which quite frankly, AI is not really uh, the best at or even capable at in most cases today. Um, and then let sort of the AI stuff do the uh, more rote, repetitive, tedious types of tasks and things like that. In addition to what you just sort of uh, repeated, which is also doing some of the things that just for a human is hard to do on their own. 100%. Yeah, I, I really like that approach. And I, I think some people are calling it human-centered AI design, or there's some other terms, but it's this notion that you start with the operator, the task, and then you think about, well, how might AI and machine learning help that operator focus on the more interesting parts of that job? Like right. every, there, every job, there's always like this tedious thing that you have to do that nobody wants to do, well, that's like a really good way for AI to come into play. And I really I really like that framing because it takes you away from this notion that AI is just going to automate everything away and that it's going to destroy jobs. I mean, I think there is some element where th there are going to be certain jobs that are not going to exist, are going to be completely different. But more so, I think that AI is just going to help people do the more interesting parts, more creative parts of a job and also help scale out their capacity across more, like just be more productive in general. Yeah, no question about it. And I mean, honestly, it, it's, it is a legitimate uh, question and potential concern around this idea of automating jobs, right? Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the current research, like if you look at stuff coming from World Economic Forum or some of the other sort of annual um, really kind of big annual uh, surveys or, or research reports around artificial intelligence in terms of in the enterprise or adoption or things like that. You know, most of it shows that um, that AI, at least in the foreseeable, predictable future, is likely to result more in a net gain of jobs than a net loss. Also, you know, one thing I, I tend to remind people of is even if you look at like the current state today in the United States, for example, um, you know, recently there's been reports that we're, we're having the lowest unemployment rate in something like 55 years or something like that. Right. right. And that's and that's at the highest level of tech, technological advancement we've ever been. Now, that being said, um, what what this type certain jobs do get automated while other new jobs get introduced and then other jobs sort of stay safe, stable. Right. They're, they're kind of the same. They're not being automated and they're not um, anything particularly new either. Uh, what happens though, is when you do have this shift from sort of jobs that are becoming somewhat obsolete or automated and you have these new roles, then the skill set and the qualifications and the experience changes. And without, uh, you know, sort of this comp compensation 
I was going to say compensatory. That's not a word. <laughs> but without this sort of like uh, balancing of of uh, focus on training and reskilling, upskilling, cross-skilling, that kind of thing to prepare people for those new jobs and, and sort of train them, you could then have situations that lead to greater inequalities and, and all sorts of other issues. So um, it's, yeah, it, there's a lot to think about there and consider. Yeah, the the classic. I mean, there's a chart that comes to mind that I that that, that I always try to reference with these types of talks is, and it's the it's it's a it's a chart um, um, uh, detailing the number of bank tellers over time, especially <laughs> since yep. the advent of the ATM. And the concern was that well, ATMs is going to come along, and you're not you're not going to have any bank tellers anymore because why would you go into the branch when you could just get your money directly from the ATM? <laughs> So you would expect the overall number of bank tellers to go down, but the reverse has happened. The you know you've seen a big increase in bank tellers uh, since the since the ATM got rolled out. Their job has changed for sure. They're not doing the same thing as before, um, but there are more bank teller positions than they were than pre uh, ATM. I don't think that's going to be the always the case, but it's a it's a nice anecdote in in, in us saying that, well, it's not necessarily going to happen as intuitively as you might think it's going to happen in terms of automation and all these jobs going away. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and the other thing people, uh, and we talked about that a lot at our South by Southwest session, which is, again, you know, AI, despite the fact that, unfortunately, a lot of people uh, may have the impression that AI is a sort of like self-guided, self-improving, self-directed, self-learning, self you know, everything uh, type of thing. Um, in reality, AI is pretty, still pretty what they call weak or narrow. You know, you train specific AI models to do very specific things. And as a result of that, not only is AI not particularly, uh, you know, well suited to multitasking, being able to do, like, you're not going to have one model that recognizes cats and images, but also can like parse, you know, entities and verbs and nouns out of natural language and can also predict you know, a stock price all in the same model, right? Um, so there's that one aspect, but then there's also the fact that um, humans, you know, the human brain is like arguably the most complex thing ever that's existed in the universe. And humans are able to do significant things that involve, um, you know, how we learn, how our intelligence works, um, common, like I said, common sense, uh, reasoning, logic, um, so on and so forth that machines just aren't even close to being able to do. And as a result, that automatically sort of eliminates the possibility of AI being able to do so many jobs that require that human uh, level of thinking and brain power, if you will. Spot on. And um, Alex, I'm wondering if we can dovetail or circle back to one, one uh, point that we were talking about earlier around AI be always being the answer. Um, here's what I found in my experience, and, I, and I, I'd love to, for you to, to tell me if this is what you're seeing or something different, but I'm getting calls to come in and work with companies and we look at certain use cases and where the company thinks they're, they're all AI opportunities, I'm seeing a lot of sort of lower hanging fruit opportunities like automation, digitization, um, uh, business process management, more so than AI. And so, like, for example, I had, I, I once worked with a company that we were trying to do some predictive maintenance stuff and all of their, all of their paperwork was in paper and pen. And I said, well, you don't need AI for this. Like the first thing that you need to do is digitize this process and you need an app to capture all the data. Then we can talk about AI later on. So I guess I'm wondering, are you seeing that too, or are you seeing that as well? Where like, maybe like certain companies think that they have to rush into AI, but maybe it's, it's something different that they should be tackling um, or, or, or focusing on? Yeah, all the time. And I'm glad you brought that up because actually why of AI, right? Like part of, uh, why I wrote my book and part of why I founded why of AI, um, which, you know, the company why of AI is all about sort of guidance strategy and training around AI. It's partly to help increase pe help people increase their sort of literacy with AI, uh, their understanding and their ability to, um, understand what it is, why it matters, how it's used, why it's used, what are the potential risks, what are the potential benefits and outcomes and results, uh, what are, how do you figure out different use cases or applications and so on. I think what you're seeing is sort of natural in that if, if all you're going on is sort of market hype or something like that, and you're hearing everybody talk about, 
oh, AI, you got to have it, right? Like, otherwise, either it's just because you hear about it all the time and it's like, oh, we don't have this, we need it. So I hear that a lot. Or if you're worried about um, competitive advantage or you're worried about your competitors taking, you know, generating your own competitive advantage and differentiation, potentially using AI, or you're worried about like, hey, are my competitors right behind me breathing down my neck because they're doing this AI stuff and they're going to mm -hmm. sort of outtake me, um, the, the natural tendency might be to, you know, want to get this sort of AI thing, right? But if you also don't understand what it is, it's hard to map the challenges you do understand to think to like these buzzwords in technology, right? So, okay, we, we have a digital trend. Like you said, it's really more of a digital transformation pro problem, right? Right now, maybe you have all this data that's still in spreadsheets or in handwritten notes or whatever it is. And you need to somehow like build, get that more automated, get the data into a digital format and into a format also that's very um, conducive to efficient analytics, if you will, right? Yes, Which is what yes. led to the whole we need data lakes and we need data warehouses and we need you know, all this other stuff. Um, so I, I, I think I see it all the time. And I think, again, I think it's just, it's just uh, sort of not understanding uh, which things match to, to what other things in terms of technology. But, um, and, and, and the people that are very good at identifying those use cases and, un and truly understanding the entire landscape of AI, I feel like, are fairly rare from what I have seen. And so I'm not surprised that this is a sort of a, a very common problem. And it's, it's one of the problems I'm trying to solve with Y of AI, actually. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a good point. So it, to, to recap, you're saying, you know, we need to equip the key decision makers within, within these organizations with a basic level of understanding of what AI is so that they're better able to spot the true opportunities for AI within their organization. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and, and be able to say things like when they're in the room, having that conversation of, um, and it could be, it doesn't have to be in the company. It could be with partners or, you know, that they work with or whatever it is, but you know, if they're in the room with someone and they're saying, well, you know, we have this problem, we have this data, it's all over the place. We need to streamline things currently to do, you know, place an order, let's say I'm just making stuff up, but it takes forever, right? We know that there's huge gains to be made by making that much more efficient. And, and the question is like, can AI do that? Someone needs to be in the room that can say, well, you know, AI for this specific thing isn't necessarily the right, what you need here is more sort of digitization and some sort of like streamline, uh, you know, automation, circle, automation yeah. regular software or RPA or something like that. We'll get the yes. job done. But here's what, what, where AI could help, right? So once you've digitized everything, maybe you want to auto generate, you know, create sort of an executive summary dashboard or something um, that's sort of alerting, like predicting at all times, like, okay, you know, what are the lead times for certain if, items that we need to order so that we're, we understand that in advance such that we can place the orders in time to make sure that we don't run out of stock of something. Once we have the data in the right place and we have, you know, the rest of the system fully oiled, if you will, um, what can we then do with that system and how can we uh, turn, you know, whatever data we were generating into uh, actionable insights, recommendations, uh, information that supports decisions and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I almost think about your investment in digital transformation, that's sort of a sunk cost that you're going to have, and it's going to help you be in a good place. Um, and it's going to help you digitize a lot of your data. But then where you're going to get a lot of return is from applying AI and, and machine learning and analytics to that data once it's digitized to help drive some of the benefit and some of the revenue that's going to pay for that, for some of that investment. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's a great point. Like, um, you know, I think the key word here is data and sometimes also some of the confusion is this, it, it's sort of like data is kind of the glue, if you will. Right. So what do I mean by that? I, I talk to people about this a lot. It's like, because you're right when you talk about, Oh, do we need AI or is this digital transfer? The same thing's true with like, you know, people throwing now blockchain or quantum computing or IOT, right? <laughs> and, 
th these terms uh, just kind of pop up in conversations with with these different things. But what's sort of the the fundamental, um, you know, sort of glue, if you will, the thing that ties it all together? And for me, it's really data, right? Like blockchain, even though the the actual definition of blockchain is something like a distributed ledger system that you know um, is un unbreakable and whatever. It's still a basically a, a, a database, right? right? It's a certain kind of database. IoT, what's IoT? Internet of Things. It's it's literally sensors that are connected to the to a network or a network that have some sort of power supply usually and gateways and some cloud processing backend or API that collects and transmits and processes data from sensors. But again, it's data. Same thing with, you know, the list just kind of goes on and on. So um, I, while a lot of people think in terms of data, um, I, I tend to focus more on the analytics side of things, which is what do you do with the data? How do you turn it into benefits, results, outcomes, values, and so on? Because in the end, um, that's sort of, where I focus, I'm less about like, how do you move data from this place, ETL data from this place to that place or clean and process and, and whatever else. It's more like, how do you use the data? And it, you really need to understand that to, I, I think that's how com companies do need a data strategy in terms of just data governance, data privacy, security, data storage, data maintenance, all that. Um, but, you know, all the data in the world can only do you so, so good if you're not really uh, using it for something. Right, right. I, 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 I really like that um, from two perspectives. One is because it makes uh, the reason for collecting the data and for your investment in machine learning tangible to everyone across the organization. So if you go to a senior executive and you're like, hey, we're collecting all this data, we're setting up this distributed database and it's all great. They're going to be like, well, I don't care. But say like, hey, we're going to set up the system so that we can predict when our customer's machine is going to fail so that we get there beforehand and we make them happy and we're able to keep the sale the next time around. OK, that makes a lot more uh, tangible sense for uh, from uh, from the executive's perspective. I'm glad. You, yeah, I agree. And I'm glad you said that, Manny, because what you said is that then allows us to um, keep the sale and get ahead of it. Right. Which is really the why that's actually why my company is called why of AI. Um, start that was with totally why. That was totally unplanned. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's so important. It goes back to what I was saying about, um, you know, how, how do you identify the right goals and benefits? All that is essentially the why, right. And you, what, what you could have just said, but you didn't, you went for the why part, uh, but often people do is you could have said, we want to predict a predictive maintenance system that can predict when a part is going to fail, right? In that case, what you said is the what, the predictive maintenance system and, and what it can do. And maybe you might throw in the how, like, we'll we'll get our top you know, machine learning engineers uh, working together with our product development team and we'll build that thing. So now you have a what and a how. But again, to your point, if you, if you pitch that to an executive or a CEO or a, a board, um, you know, I would hope that their first question is, okay, great. Why? Right. <laughs> and the why, the why is, you know, like you said, uh, we decrease lost revenue, we increase efficiency, we can schedule better, we can, uh, you know, predict downtime better, uh, we can optimize our parts inventory better, like the why, 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 why? So, it's so important. The, the, the other key, uh, I think, uh, aspect here is that if you have that why and you're starting with the end goal, it helps you identify what subset of data really matters to you as an organization. Yeah. So I think especially now, as like I think we're getting to the point where we're going to be able to capture an infinite amount of data points. And so the question is going to be like not necessarily if we capture the data is what subsection of this infinite amount of data points are really valuable that we should be capturing and storing long term. And so if you start with a data first strategy, then your your inclination is going to be like, we got to have everything, you're going to have this sort of hoarding mentality. And you're mm -hmm. going to have data swamps and that are not going to be manageable. Right. But if you start with the why first to, to, to use your term is you can work backwards and say, well, if we want to 
uh, increase sales and increase customer satisfaction by making sure that things don't fail. And if they fail, they're, they're, um, we're going to fix them right away. Then these are the four sensors that we need. And we need to capture them in, at this level. And we should always maintain them. And that should be like our golden um, um, data set. And so I, I would also say that it, it applies to the algorithms as well in terms of what you're going to use. Because as you know, there are there are almost a thousand different types of algorithms and variations and different ways you can optimize them. There's a, there's a, a lot of variability in terms of what you can use from an algorithm perspective. And if you're starting there, you're going to be like just grabbing everything. But if you're starting with the why, then you're like, okay, well, I need to predict when this is going to fail within two days. Okay, I can use a simple rules-based approach to do that. And that that's going to get me to my goal. Let's push it to production and let's start generating revenue. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love everything you just said. Uh, and there's so much I can unpack there. Um, it, yeah, I love that. Um, going back to the data swamp concept and everything, and, and, and I might be jumping ahead in our conversation a little bit, but this idea of like, how do you get started, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're right about that, right? Like I've worked with big enterprise companies, Fortune 100 companies, for Fortune 500 companies. Um, and a lot of times the... And, and other and everything down to early stage start too and uh everything in between but a lot of times you're right people are thinking well we need all this data and we need to put it somewhere and all of a sudden this becomes this like two-year very expensive project to like build out a data warehouse and you know set up all these integrations and all this etl and all this everything it's very daunting it can be very overwhelming it sounds expensive. It sounds like it'll take a lot of time. It's your point. And then you get to the end and maybe you just have a data swamp. And oh, by the way, the new, the new hotness is called a lake house instead of a data lake, or, right? Um, by the time you're done with that. But I, I think you're right in terms of starting with that why, the goal, and then working backwards and saying, hey, can we build something quickly? Um, start with a proof of concept, something like go for the small wins, try and prove out something. Again, part of, part of going back to this sort of idea of AI literacy and understanding and the why is every, every, a lot of times what I've seen is, you know, people at the companies might not understand what the gains potentially are, where, how it will end up being used AI. Right. right. And, and when someone come, if someone were to come in with like this giant roadmap, that's equally as daunting as like building out a data warehouse from scratch. Right then you know that starts to sound like a lot of resources like oh well now we have to build out an entire data science team and like what does that all entail and we need data engineers too do we need ai researchers or research scientists it, depending on what we're trying to do and so on and so forth um whereas you can just say you know hey like i'm going to use a super simple example here right like let's say it's like email marketing and, and, and actually I'll speak briefly to ROI as well. This idea of like, how do you figure out ROI? Cause again, um, and we haven't gotten into this just yet, but ROI is very difficult too, because ultimately AI and ML are very scientific fields in general. They're more like R and D. There's a reason there's the word science and data science and in computer science, but that's jumping way ahead. Um, but again, you know, start small, you say, okay, look, we know that we uh, do so many conversions on our email marketing campaigns every year, right? And we know that on average, those conversions result in so many dollars in sales, let's say, and I'm kind of just making this up on the fly. And so therefore, you know, our email marketing results generally on average in, you know, $5 million a year uh, in, in revenue, let's say. Um, and so you ask yourself, let's say, you know, one of your goals is how can we, how can we make our email marketing campaigns more effective, you know, generate some more revenues, like even by 5%, let's just choose a goal, right? Um, well, if we can increase our revenues by 5%, that's what a quarter million dollars extra revenue a year. Um, how can we do that? Right? Well, so then we could start to think of, well, how do we maybe use some AI techniques to create emails that are a little bit more personalized or whatever the case may be. If we can, if we can, you know, increase that, that conversion rate by 5%, that could be this potential revenue. Um, but it, it gives you revenue gain, sorry, or lift. So it gives you a, an idea of a small project, something you could get started with. 
you might even be able to, if you don't have an in-house data scientist or machine learning engineer, maybe you can find a, a single contractor or freelancer or something like that, or a partner that you can work with and sort of start small. And once you can show to everybody, especially, and this is the key, the people that have budgets and that need to approve these types of, um, not only approve, but prioritize these types of investments in technology. Um, you know, now you start to have some, a story that's coming together and something you can point to and say, you know, here you go, we did this, here's our other ideas and here's why I think they'll benefit the company and so on and so forth. And, you know, you could sort of build your way up into a more sophisticated, um, fully featured sort of, um, analytics or advanced analytics program. I, I really like that. You're essentially, you're starting with a global KPI that's tied to revenue or cost. Then you're saying, hey, the goal would be to increase this by a certain percentage. And then you're saying, well, what type of initiatives or methods or techniques can we use that are AI ML related that will help us get to that, to get to that metric of increase 5%, 10%, whatever you have that. And then you do a brief, a POC or a proof of model to show that it's possible in an ad hoc kind of low effort type of way. And then once you get buy-in, then you go all in into by productionalizing it and building it out and scaling it out. Is that fair? I think that's pretty close to what I was saying. Yeah. And you might not, you know, not every use case, if you will, might tie directly to the top level business goal, but it might align up to the top level business goal. Yes. So a good example is like OKRs, right? For those, those of us that have ever come across or are familiar with objective key results used in, in setting goals for, you know, at the top level of companies, but at the also um, business function level of companies or departmental level, and then to trickles down to individual employees and everyone sort of sets their goals that lines up to a level above. So by the time you say, okay, we're going to increase our net revenue by X, it may be by the time it gets down to the marketing department uh, and specific subset of that department, um, like the digital department, uh, uh, marketing department or social or whatever it is, uh, the goal might be, uh, you know, not quite like phrased in terms of the top level goal, but it certainly lines up, should line up to the top level goal. The other thing I will say is that one of the other things that's worth mentioning is that not everything has to line up to, you know, purely business related goals or specifically like the traditional sort of revenue or profit type goals, right? A lot of times AI can be very, very helpful in terms of also helping people um, and their, you know, companies, uh, customer retention, customer happiness, Cust reduce customer churn, uh, reduce increase customer delight and enjoyment using their products or services. Same with end users. The other thing too that's worth mentioning. So sometimes the goals are those kinds of things too because they'll they'll help in other ways with the company, right? Um, right. And then one of the other things I would say along those lines is that also one of the the best things about AI in my perspective and, and why I am interested in the field a lot is the potential to have a big impact in terms of society, the environment, um, and, and things like that. So, and, and people's health and health related outcomes. So for example, you know, more and more we're seeing AI potentially help save rainforests from deforestation or help combat global climate change or help with plastics in the ocean or other pollutants in the ocean. Uh, or predicting natural disasters that can then, you know, help save lives. Same with um, diagnostics, like medical diagnostics and early disease detection and earlier, more personalized treatments resulting in better health outcomes. Um, they may or may not, depending on the type of organizations that are building these solutions, necessarily be super driven by these kind of more for, for pro traditional for-profit goals. Uh, but or they're, they're, they're driven for other things. And, um, there's, there's still really important, uh, aspects of, you know, kind of the benefits and the why of AI. <laughs> I, I, I would definitely, I want to come back to that because I have some good examples that I think we should talk about, but before I do, um, circling back to POC and proving out the concept, do you have an ideal time frame for how long that should take? 
And um, what does that look like for you? Is that like an Excel spreadsheet that has outputs and predictions? Is that an application? Is that a notebook? What are you thinking there? What what would satisfy your criteria there? Uh, sorry, say the, the last part again in terms of the output thing that you said. It, right. So like one, should it take four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks? Oh, and then yeah. the second is, is what, what should you be looking for over the course of those four weeks? Do you want an Excel spreadsheet that says like, oh, like for this lead, here's Got the it. percent probability that it's going to close and, you know, and get some validation on that. Or do you want a, a web app that kind of walks the marketer through all these and, and lets them interact with it? I'm, I'm just guessing like, what's like, what's the mechanism for you to, to prove that that's a really good use case that we should move forward with? Yeah, that's, so this is a great question. Um, and it's a complex question. Um, so yes, I do have sort of rules of thumb. Um, one of them is, you know, in general, so I'll start with rules of thumb kind of, but it's that, you know, it's rules of thumb and it's also scientific, like we talked about. Right. Um, and there's a lot more that goes into this, which I'll touch on. Um, so generally speaking, like if you're just trying to prove something out quick and dirty, you have data available, uh, you've identified the use case and the potential for a POC, like a proof of concept or, you know, a prototype you know, you might be able to build something, let's say in three months, that that's not an unreasonable goal. Um, and then from there, could you then, you know, actually test it in, in part of a bigger product type thing to start to test like real market fit or product fit or whatever with actual users and customers, maybe that's within six months, let's say. And then going beyond that and building out the kinds of feedback and monitoring mechanisms that you need and, um, full blown production, you know, uh, you know, solution and commercialization, things like that. I mean, it really could take a year to two years. Now, that being said, it all depends on what it is you're talking about. What is the use case? What kind of data is involved? Um, how big of a, are we talking like one small little feature? Or are we talking about an entire thing that has a user interface of some sort, whether it's interacting with a device? through speech or it's a mobile app or it's a web app, um, you know, is it just one model that we're deploying or is it a model that then powers like a bigger solution and we're having to build that entire solution. So we need more of a whole product development team, like a UX UI designer, QA folks, data science folks, front end, back end software engineers, uh, API developers and all that. So in addition, part of what makes that very, uh, tricky sometimes and, and variable is that, and I talk about this in my book, I created some uh, frameworks and models that I introduced in the book. One of them is this idea of maturity. Uh, there, I have a readiness model, but I also have a couple of different maturity models that I introduce. And that's really important. You know, maturity is important. So for example, some companies that already have a data science team or a machine learning team, and they've been, you know, building certain kinds of models for quite some time. They have a lot of muscle memory, if you will, from that. You know, they can just dive right in. They know what tools they want to use. They know what learning algorithms they want to try. They know, you know, how to tune those models, how to better, you know, prepare and enhance the data to get the best possible performing models and so on. They may be able to iterate to a solution much quicker than, say, uh, a team or a, a, a person that's just getting started with some of these techniques that sort of has to ramp up on um, so, so very many different things and how to, how to experiment, how to find, choose the right kinds of models, how to tune those models, how to pick which ones are the best ones, how to know when to stop. Like, did we, is this the best performance we're going to get or can we squeeze some more performance out of it? Um, and so on and so forth. And then the other, aspect of this that's really key and it could also add a little bit of variability here is are you trying to do something that's super well established it's been around for a while in ai and machine learning um and there's even pre-trained models out there or sort of cloud apis right off the shelf so this this begs the whole build versus buy type question too right like is this something you can just kind of plug into or use right away or are you really, you know, 
identifying use cases that could benefit from some of the most cutting edge state of the art emerging types of machine learning algorithms and techniques and AI techniques that really require pushing a, a bit of an envelope, right? And, you know, going through the journey of, you know, finding a research paper out there on archive and turning that into some real world, you know, code or framework or API or uh, something, right? Um, and, and, and real world use case with actual benefits. That's a different story. And that when it comes to some of the companies out there that do do that and have AI researchers and re research scientists on staff, um, you know, some of those types of things can take a much longer time because you're really, it's very evergreen, right? And you're, you're trying to innovate and pioneer the way with using some of these like really just fresh off the press, if you will, emerging uh, techniques. Right. And I, I really like that, that staggered approach as well. You mentioned three months prototype, six months to test, and then one year to productionalize. And I think that's that that's the right approach. Um, my sense is that uh, the the rookie mistake is to focus simply on the technology when it comes to implementing AI and front loading that. Like, can I build a model? Can I push it to production? But the pro move is to actually front load um, your the 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 front load your ability to prove out the business case a that there's value, and two that there's user interest. And to the extent that you can minimize your technical build while while trying to test out for those two factors early on in the process, you're going to win. Because I've been a part of too many projects where the technology is great, it works, it, take, it takes us like two years to implement, and then we deploy it and crickets. Like there's no interest uh, either by the users, people are ignoring our predictions that we worked so hard, even though it's like a super complicated random forest type of model. And the executives don't care because it's not making any money for anybody. So I always say like your like your implementation process, like, you know, if it's a simple rules based regression model, fine. Well, A, let's make sure that people care about this and let's and, and B, let's make sure that we're going to be able to make money off of this. Yeah, I mean, and you brought up an interesting point too, or like many interesting points, but one about this idea of uh, AI in production, which is much uh, easier said than done and often where a lot of the fail failures and time, you know, happens. Um, but I agree. It's, it's, it's the why, I mean, for me, you know, I, I always start at the, the, high, the goals is like the highest level, but just purely on the AI side, I start with kind of the area of AI. So whether is this recommenders and personalization, is this, you know, computer vision and pattern recognition, is it predictive analytics? Uh, is it natural language stuff? And then under that, I sort of always talk about tasks, like what are the tasks you're trying to accomplish, right? Um, another way to put it would be kind of the use cases. You know, is it to predict the stock price? Is it to de detect a spam e email? Is it to detect a, you know, classify certain kinds of skin lesions as cancerous or not cancerous? And if they're cancerous, which kinds of cancers, right? That's sort of the individual uh, tasks and use cases. And then below that is sort of the learning algorithm level, right? Um, or And tools, right? Um, at the end of the day, and granted nowadays, I'm much more focused on the vision and strategy side than the, the practical implementation side in terms of, you know, I'm not sitting in a computer trying all the models or anything like that all the time, but I'm extremely well aware, uh, up to speed on what tools are out there, uh, what the different kinds of learning algorithms are out there, what the trade-offs are between them and why you choose one over the other. Um, and what I often see is that practitioners may um, sort of speak more to those learning algorithms and those techniques and tools when to your point, that's not really what's relevant, right? Um, it's like, it's like if you're trying to classify an email as spam, you could probably use naive Bayes. You can use logistic regression. You can use neural networks and deep learning. You can use random forest. You, I mean, it'll all do the same thing, right? So in, in some ways, that doesn't really matter depending who you are. If you're the person building the solution and taking into account all the trade-offs of why you choose one over the other in terms of cost, resources required, cloud compute required, uh, you know, uh, explainability, interpretability, transparency, and all the other considerations that one must consider at the algorithmic and tool-based level, then yes, that, that stuff is very important and matters a lot and is part of your day-to-day -day job. 
But if you're the CEO or the executive and you're trying to say, Hey, how can we, you know, how can we decrease customer churn by 10% over the next you know, year? Um, you know, all you really need to hear is, well, Hey, here's how we have data around our, in our CRM and, uh, from someone is we have data in our CRM and we know that, you know, we can find like what the most likely through these techniques, what the most likely sort of factors and predictors of churn are, um, and sort of be able to predict for any given customer, you know, what, what their potential for churn is. And once we sort of know who the high risk customers are, we can then do things like offer certain discounts or customize, you know, promotions or whatever it is to see if we can reduce the churn and go from there and, and come up with like hypotheses and experiments to, um, you know, have a, have a direct impact on the business. Right. Um, and that's, that's at the end of the day, what really matters, depending who you're talking to, it all matters. So right. not to diminish, uh, the algorithmic stuff or the tool based stuff, but I think that's, that's why we've gotten along. I mean, I should mention that we met a couple of years back and we hit it off right away. And I, I felt like in part, it's because you, you had a very practical approach to AI and machine learning. And I, it really resonated with me, not so theoretical and academic. You still definitely had that pedigree, but you were able to translate that into something that was tangible that that an engineer or a manager or business executive could could interpret. And I'm sure you're, you're capturing that in the why of AI, and you definitely have that in your book, AI uh, for People and for and for Business. I'm, I guess I'm wondering, go, going back to uh, your your start in IndyCar, I would imagine that that, that comes from the fact that you like for analytics for your job as an IndyCar engineer or data scientist, I'm not even sure the term was around back then, but you probably had some like real world expectations. Like this was not like a science project R and D kind of thing. Like you need, you probably needed to show like tangible insights to a, to a, an expert that had there were there high stakes that are involved. And unless you were able to do that and show your value every single race and every day, then you were going to get sort of kicked out the door. <laughs> is that is that fair? Is that is that where you're kind of getting this practical approach to AI, or can you talk talk to us a little bit more about what you're carrying over from that from that background? Yeah, no. I, well, first of all, thanks for the kind words, and second of all, um, yeah, it is, it's good timing to bring that up because you know, obviously, with Drive to Survive out there right now, which is I don't know if you've seen that, but it's a very cool show, and a lot of people are sort of becoming race fans that that never were before, which is kind of cool. Um, but no, I mean, so data is everything in racing, a hundred percent, everything, you know, so is the driver, obviously, actually there's so much that goes into it. I mean, you can't, you cannot win a race without it, 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 perfect pit stops, uh, perfect, uh, strategy, uh, great, maybe not perfect, but as best as possible pit stops, strategy, uh, drivers, car setup. You know, the list just goes on, 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 on. And so it's really a collaborative teamwork effort to win races. It's very difficult um, and it does require a ton of data. And to your point, you know, when I was in the business of pretty much 10 years, uh, you know, people weren't really using the term data scientist just yet, but, or internet of things, but it was both at the very same time. Cause each of these cars has like 80 to 90 sensors on them. Some of them are measuring, you know, capturing data at like a thousand, uh, samples per second. So you'd have like billions and billions of data points every single time the car went on the track. And the uh, the race season is relentless. So in IndyCar racing, a lot of people think of the Indianapolis 500, which is the big event of the year. It's kind of the Super Bowl race, but it's only one of usually like 18 races worldwide. So we raced in Japan, Australia, Brazil, Europe, Canada, all over the place, Mexico, you name it, and the U.S., and every track's different, every track, the conditions are diff different, uh, and so on and so forth. And so you have all this data. It's not just car data from sensors that you're measuring. You also have driver feedback data, which is like more like natural language. Ooh, you have the interaction between the car and the driver. That's got to be insane. Yeah, that. And then you have timing and scoring data. So, you know, from the series, IndyCar series, that, you know, every time all the cars are on track, you know, you have your, your split times, you have your lap times, uh, it, it comes in as a live feed. So you have like this IOT thing where you're collecting all this data from sensors and you're sending it over RF or telemetry. Uh, but you have tons of, so 
And in addition, you have millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars on the line uh, through and sponsor demands and expectations. You have a driver's life on the line. I mean, these drivers are driving at, at times up to almost 250 miles an hour with essentially concrete walls everywhere all around them um, with, with up to 32 other cars in, in the case of the Indy 500, slicing and dicing through traffic. And you're going from one event to the next all year round. And even when the racing season is not happening, you're also testing, right? You're, you're doing track testing at certain places. You're doing wind tunnel testing. You're doing suspension testing. You're doing simulate computer simulation stuff. Um, hey, Alex, the, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm wondering yeah. if you could, I got to ask this question. What would be your typical day as a now data scientist, um, IndyCar data scientist on, on the day of, of race day? So what does that look like? What are you doing to set up your equipment? How are you adjusting the data? What are you analyzing? What are you giving to your to your to your expert? Yeah, that's a great question because the 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 typical day, if you will, depends on the day. It's not the same every day. It depends if you're in a race weekend, if you're in between races, if you're off season. Let's say a race uh, but, day. But a race day, race day is interesting because on a race day, you sort of did everything you could do up until the point of the race, right? All the practice sessions are over. You've already qualified, so you're done with that. Basically, it is what it is. You're going to start the race. <laughs> you're going to start the race where you're going to start the race. Yeah. And once the green flag drops for the first time in the race, right, once the race starts, there's only one goal in that race, and that is to get to the checkered flag quicker and sooner than any other car on track, right? That's the only goal. Safely. And the only way really to do that, there's two ways to do that. One is you're just raw faster than anybody else. So your, your pure speed and performance, you could beat everybody on track because you, you have a better driver and car combination, um, or you do it through strategy and strategy, uh, which was always my specialty in the thing I did both. So I optimized the race car. I worked with the drivers. I looked at the data. I created predictive models, all that, but strategy was really my uh, passion thing uh, as well. And so as a strategist, you're the person deciding when do you pit, how much fuel do you put in the car? What tires do you put on the car? What tire pressure should you use? Cause that actually inf impacts the balance of the car. Uh, how do you coach the dri the driver while they're on track during the race? on what things they can change in the cockpit to change the performance and balance of the car. Uh, what are your competitors doing? What if there's a crash and a yellow flag comes out? Do you stay out? Do you come in? Um, how many laps are left in the race and what, how many more pit stops are you likely to have to do? Uh, and the list goes on and on. And as a strategist, the information you have in real time during the race is one from the driver telling you how the car feels to them and how the race is going two, the timing and scoring data, three, the car data, the telemetry data. So you're looking at real time, uh, you know, data around the, how the car's handling and performing and all sorts of other things. Um, and, and you're basically having to make really critical decisions on the fly, real time, uh, huge accountability, huge, um, huge pressure, Sponsors everywhere, team owners everywhere, millions of dollars in driver's life on the line. It's 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 very intense. I gotta admit, it's not for everyone. I've worked with a lot of people that didn't love doing being a race strategist at all because it was a bit too much. Um, and I've seen people run cars out of fuel during a race by accident because their their fuel calculations were wrong and Dang. get and get fired right on the spot. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's not for the faint of heart usually, but it's uh, it's it's fun. That's why you're so calm and collective. You've been you've been under uh, under the gun for uh, for a couple of these races, I'm sure. Yeah, it, that's a, that's funny because when I, I yeah I I finally transitioned to the tech industry from racing. I'd been pounding the pavement as it were for so long and traveling way too many days a year, and missing my summers, and just felt like it was time to move on and kind of get off the road and move some out of Indianapolis and you know do something else and. Uh, it, when I first showed up on sort of the corporate sort of tech side scene, you know, I, I was sort of like, you know, in my first gig, uh, you know, people, Boring. Are people are stressed <laughs> out. I'm like, oh, we got all these deadlines. Right. And like, I'm like, well, well, when's that? When do we have to have that ready to go? And they're like, well, I mean, it's due in like four weeks. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> 
I'm like, uh, okay. And yeah, it was just, it, <laughs> it, it, it took them a lot of adjusting because the, uh, the non-racing world moves at a much uh, different pace. Let's just that That's great. That so way. you're, you're a data scientist on track. You need to make recommendations on when to pit the tire pressure when to fuel up you're taking all these different data sources the driver the car scoring data what's scoring data you mentioned yeah yeah so basically as all the cars are going around the track there's a there's software that uh, all the teams have access to that consumes a live stream of data that the series the indycar series is is creating basically they have what's called beacons all around the track and so let's say, you know, you're going around the track, your car's going around the track. Um, every time you cross one of these beacons, it's like a trap time, right? It's, it's like in the Olympics or something, you know, when you're watching the, the sprints on, on the running track, um, you know, okay, you got to this line in three quarters of a second, and then you got to the next line, uh, you know, so many seconds later. And it's sort of measuring your speed and the time it takes you to get from different segments or splits around doing one lap around the track and also your lap time, which is, you know, for each lap that you do around the track, you have what's called a lap time. Uh, so certain tracks, it might take you 45 seconds to do one lap on average. Some might be a minute and a half if it's more like a street or road course. And so, you know, you measure how fast you're going largely by your lap time. Um, and you want it to be as low as possible, right. Compared to yep. your competitors. Yep. Uh, and so um, that's the timing and scoring data, but there's a lot more data. So they're also tracking like, when did you pit last? How many laps has it been since your last pit? Um, whether, like I say, your, your segment times, your lap times, your speeds, uh, what all your competitors, so you can see what everybody's doing. Um, when, when was the last yellow flag uh, pit windows. I mean, I could go on and on. There's, there's a lot to consume uh, as the race is going on. That's amazing. And I guess, I guess that this has to be like complicated by the fact that you have other players that are also making their adjustments. And so you have to incorporate that. Like it's a sort of a game theory kind of element too, that you have to think about. Yeah. Woo. So you, what you need to do is you need to launch a new module on the Y of AI just on this, like an introduction to IndyCar racing for data scientists. I think that would be awesome. I have a question here from the audience. Are the calculations done on the car via high bandwidth, low latency connection? High uh Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, good question. Some calculations are done on the car, but most of what happens on the car is more of a data acquisition system. So think of it more as, you know, you have sort of a, a data, uh, a hard drive, if you will, right? That's connected to like 80, 90 sensors. You could calibrate all the sensors. You could set their um, sampling rates uh, or recording frequency type of thing. Uh, and then once those sensors are actively measuring things, they're doing two things. One, they're sending data to the acquisition system in full fidelity. So like if you have a sensor measuring at a thousand kilohertz or a thousand samples a second, you know, the onboard system is measuring uh, at the frequencies or sampling rates that all the sensors are set at so that every time the car comes back to the pitch, you can plug in a cable and essentially download or dump all the data from that last outing on track so that the engineers can uh, analyze it in full fidelity offline. Now, in real time, though, uh, as the car is actually going around the track, the car is obviously not connected to any wires, right? So you have to send the data via usually either RF telemetry, so radio frequency telemetry, uh, back to the pits. But sometimes, you know, teams will set up a global satellite uplink type setup where you also can send that via satellite back to even your headquarters. So not just, so now maybe you, you have both engineers at the track, track side, right in the pits, analyzing some data real time, usually not all of it because or necessarily at the full fidelity that it's being recorded on the car, because otherwise that's just a huge amount of data to send over the, over um, the airwaves, if you will. Um, but you might also have engineers back at your headquarters, right? Uh, like in the case of Formula One, big Formula One teams um, that are also real time analyzing the data and trying to figure out, you know, what to do with the car to make it quicker. Cause these cars, not, not only is, is the driver, I mean, the drivers in the car, but what a lot of people don't realize is that um, the cars themselves are so tunable 
that there's literally it's it's a permutation or combinatorics explosion problem where there's infinitely number an infinite number of different levers and adjustments you can make to the car itself mm. which directly impact the overall performance capability of the car and and the handling and feel of the car for the driver and it's all very specific to that driver to that track to the conditions is it dry is it wet is it hot is it not is the sun out is it windy all these things um require changes usually for the same driver require changes to the car setup uh you know uh even constantly throughout the race weekend um and so to your point manny you're you're not only trying to optimize things for yourself you're fighting against an entire team of engineers and strategists on other teams and maybe there's 32 other teams uh that all have their own strategists and engineers and you're trying to the drivers are trying to outdrive each other and win through brute like speed and and talent on track and and you also have all these teams that trying to out engineer and out strategize each other at the same time and you really don't know what the other teams are doing so right you, you're just and you have the weather and crashes and you have all this like everything. random stuff that can come in. and you're reacting Ooh, in fun. real time to, to everything yeah I'm getting my, my pulse is racing just kind of hearing you talk about it. It's so I can't imagine how I was in real time. <laughs> um, I, I feel I feel like we could spend a lot more time on that, maybe for a follow-up episode. Um, Alex, tell us about how people can get in contact with you. Uh, tell us about the why of AI, um, how people can learn more about that and your books and your services. Yeah, no, thank thank you so much for having me on. Uh, first of all, Manny, this is awesome. I've known you for a while and it's always great chatting with you. Uh, and um, yeah, no, so why of AI, like I said earlier, um, basically we focus mostly on sort of AI vision and strategy, um, like the, we call ourselves an AI management consulting and training company, but essentially the three core areas of the company are guidance, strategy, and training. So um, whether you need sort of ad hoc guidance, uh, ad hoc sort of advisory sessions, or just help thinking through like potential AI use cases or mapping, you know, business problems to potential AI solutions, things like that. We help with that um, as well as, you know, coaching around AI and, and so on. And then on the strategy side, it's really more about, you know, identifying many use cases and then prioritizing them and, you know, sort of road mapping everything and identifying potential risks and, and phasing things out. Like what's the plan of execution? How do you go from, you know, sort of some of these ideas to actually having a plan to execute on them. And then lastly, on the training side, we have courses online at your own pace, on-demand courses and certifications that we offer. We're just rolling those out now. We have one already, um, AI for decision makers, uh, which is great for people, you know, anyone that wants to better understand AI uh, at the appropriate level and understand how AI can help make decisions and support you know, business activities and um, create, act, you know, generate actionable outcomes and, and benefits and results as we discussed. Um, and so, you know, check out yofai.com. Feel free to contact us via the website. We have a contact there. Um, I'm on social as well. If anybody wants to follow me that way, books on Amazon, Target and any Barnes and Noble and any other outlet. Um, if, you know, if you want to check that out, you're more than welcome to. And uh, I really enjoyed yeah. it. it. The book is AI for people and business. It's I like it because it's AI, but for business folks, I don't think there are a lot of books out there. There are a few that I can like read off, but even those are they're very technical. But I feel like this is like pretty good for like a manager or an executive to pick up. Um, yep. So definitely check out that book. I got I have a um, here's an idea for you, Alex. You should. Um, incorporate the racing element with the coursework it's almost like you know introduction to data science but then we're going to take you out to the racetrack to see how it applies to the racetrack and maybe even like take you around a couple laps to, to help you appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> there you go I'll, I'll start um i'll start making calls to all my my buddies uh still in indycar racing i still talk to, you, to you them to you come on site, we do a couple of hours of AI training, then we get in the racetrack and, you know, that's your kind of like your your executive workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it, Manny. Thank you for the idea. I appreciate it. That's awesome. uh, Very neat. Well, Alex, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.